Um, uh, just a few words of uh, welcome to Things Matter, um, which is interesting that that would be even a hypothesis worth defending. Um, and, and I thought of, of thought of the name of your office when when uh, the sort of Internet of Things is coming up. The assumption of the Internet of Things is is that things matter or would be made to matter by being. Um, turned into sort of digital objects. But I think it's such, it's such a great uh, title for, for um, your operation, which I think sort of formally began in 2001. So this would be like a 10-year checkup, like a kind of medical uh, checkup. And, and Samini and Tom are, are products of the old Wisconsin, Princeton, Bangkok axis. Um, and all of their work, I think, has a lot to do with that, uh, probably that detour all the elements of it, the Wisconsin element, the Princeton element, and the Bangkok, but the most important being the last move, the, you know, what well, may not be the last move, but the last move you made to Bangkok, because I think what's super interesting about your uh, office, I mean, at the beginning, you can sort of describe it like other interesting offices as sort of multidimensional and crossing an enormous territory from installations, furnitures, interiors, buildings, uh, artwork, and so on, even architecture. Um, but I think what's different is a little bit about is what's different is what you meet along the way if you follow that trajectory because in, in, interspersed in there are you know robots and video cameras and plants where you least expect them and um, uh, seats that if you sit on turn transparent. So I mean, so at, at every level there's a sort of a tweaking uh, of that axis, and so it's not really I think so much about a multi-dimensional office in which anything is. Possible. There is a kind of um, n sort of a, a noodling away in a more subversive sense about uh, uh, ass assumptions. So architecture, in its classic form, comes back again and again, and very like an apartment or a building or a house and so on. But in a way, they get they become part of this wider uh, deflection of assumptions about what it means to be in space. And somehow, I, and I don't know why or how, but I guess I'm going to learn tonight. Bangkok kind of uh, is what's really inserting itself into the sequence. So you could either see the work as the sort of, a, a, as a kind of, uh, you know, almost tropical product of the conditions of, of life in Bangkok. Um, like, or, or what would Bangkok do with an interesting young architectural office? It might do this, right? So you could, you could understand the, the work of this office as actually the work of Bangkok on these innocent, uh, interesting, intelligent, uh, architects, or you see it the other way around, as interesting, intelligent architects who in Bangkok have found an absolutely unique laboratory environment to disturb assumptions about the role of the architect and um, simple issues. And it seems to me very often the projects address very simple questions about what it means to sit, what it means to walk, what it means to go home, what it means to communicate, what is a toy, all these kinds of questions. So I think it's a great uh, uh, office, and like any other medical checkup, hope it's not too painful um, to be with us, but it's a real pleasure that you took the long journey to sort of come back a little bit to report on um, either your experiment in, in Bangkok or Bangkok's experiment on you. You could imagine Bangkok talking to another city and saying, you can't believe what we've done with these two architects. Um, and then another city saying, well, you know what we did with, uh, and I think a little bit in that spirit. For this to happen, it requires that the, that the, um, the kind of practitioners al allow the experiment to take place. So it's a bit like when um, somebody agrees to be part of a medical experiment. So I think there's a very, very interesting openness in this office to a, a vulnerability that has been turned into uh, work. And that's a, kind of a last comment that I think comes from this vulnerability, which is, which is there is um, an extraordinary delicacy in the middle of the work, and it's very consistent. Uh, throughout. It's even kind of po polemical. I have no idea, never been to Bangkok, so I can't give you a kind of spin on what this kind of delicacy might mean and whether or not that's just a sort of misunderstanding on my part, but I really like it a lot, so I'm looking forward to seeing it. Welcome.
going to begin with a project we did for Thailand's Ministry of Information and Communication Technology as part of a national science fair for school children. Our brief was to build an environment to demonstrate how specific technologies will impact our lives in the future. The client basically asked us to make a kind of house of the future as a backdrop to the technologies. We quickly saw that these futuristic technologies were just the next season of tech gadget, camera phones, internet refrigerators, RFID tags in the supermarket. The ministry had basically just given the space over to Nokia, Samsung, and various telecom providers. In a long-running conspiracy to make 10-year-old school kids from upcountry Thailand covet internet refrigerators. This didn't seem like the message we wanted to send. But we made this model. And we really liked the way that it looked through this vintage camera phone, empty and sad and abandoned. Consumer technology products that are supposed to enable this fabulous futuristic lifestyle apparently instead just emitted blue radiation made people disappear, turned everything into white cardboard. And we thought, that's the kind of message we want to send. Not minimalism, nihilism. So we convinced that the, the client that white was futuristic and cheap and persuaded them not to cover every surface with corporate logos. And then we stood in this space where everything was white except for the gadgets, and it was truly creepy. It was an Alice in Wonderland kind of feeling, like we'd been shrunken down and forced to live in a one to 10 museum board model. But now wireless technologies were the only reality left. Even our friends had been turned into models. Then, just before 10,000 school children per day arrived, our model world was invaded by models. How to demonstrate the technology to children. This was something we needed to learn about Thailand. Public space just isn't considered done without a host of tight-skirted, knee-high booted pr promotional models, smiling and flirting with anyone who will take a brochure or witness their product demonstration. They aren't just models. In Thai, they are prestige. If you're used to promotional models from model shows, tool calendars, and beer garden, pretties also sell inkjet cartridges, textbooks, and internet refrigerators. We think that pretty might not foster positive attitude towards women in general. We also think they might not be very effective in communicating the significance of new technologies, but those are not our fights. We object to pretties as bad design. They are being used in place of more appropriate, thoughtful, and engaging objects, environments, and situations. In contemporary cities, not just Bangkok, this is a, that's a desperate need to fill our vaguely programmed public spaces, to put something in the middle to keep people from slipping away. We need attractive fillers of space and time. We crave content. In Bangkok, the most cost-effective solution to this is to hire a pretty girl to stand in for content. They cost about $30 a day. We take the pretties as a challenge. We need to make design that thwarts the pretties by giving them no place to stand, nothing to do, by making something more photogenic than they are, something more interesting to flirt with, something that communicates a more distinctive me message. It's easy to make an object that's smarter than a pretty. Can we make an environment that's sexier than a pretty? or a poi exhibition, a tempting installation, we embarked on a series of small, temporary, and very public projects in Bangkok in an effort to occupy the gaping holes that are left in the city and culture. I think of it as a kind of penance, because in architecture school, we designed containers, and we left this blank spot and said, put content here. And then we got to the real world and found it was filled with these holes, holes where something needed to be put and it was being filled with total crap. Pretties with megaphones. Here there's one such hole. When we first visited, this department store was under construction, and the owner wondered what he should do with this central atrium space. His architect had planned to put trees and fountains and benches in it. Of course we said, don't do that, it will look so old fashioned. 
That space should be totally open and flexible to events like concerts and art shows. And this is something architects like to do. We want to make a nice big shape, space with a shape we like. And we say, well, you can do anything with this space. It's flexible. It's event space. It has shifting program. You can project media onto it. As technology and culture changes, the contents of the space will change with it. We can't possibly predict how you'll be using it, and so on. And all of this is actually true. Architecture is slow, heavy, cumbersome compared to many other parts of our culture. We can't keep up. But it's also a cop out. We take so little responsibility for what goes there, which can so easily undo our best intentions. A nice, thoughtful, innovative container can easily be filled with something which is ugly and backward, and no one will ever remember your nice container. As it happens, this department store decided not to do the plants and water fountains. They put a big empty void in the middle of the store, and it felt empty. It's the size of a high school gymnasium with the same lighting, and <laughs> no one is willing to <laughs> walk through it because they feel like they're on display. Even when there's a lot of people in the store shopping, it always feels empty and depressing to have this big empty hole in the middle. Retail abhors the void. The store needed to put something in it and needed to get people to come into the store. They thought, people like music. So they decided to have a little two-week series of concerts and DJ sessions. The company would be an exhibition of fabric music memorabilia of some celebrity. That way, even when the concert wouldn't be on, there would be something to look at. It's, strange, it's a strange thing that we are displaying music here visually. The records, CDs, and instruments are not meant to be played. They are DJs who supply the music for the event. So we are left with trying to show off stuff around music that we can find. We figured we should make the opposite of an iPod. Listening to recorded music was recently a multi-sensory interactive social experience. Vinyl records had to be pulled from huge graphic sleeves handled by their edges and cued by dropping a needle in just the right groove. Scratch the record or bump the table and everyone would hear it. All of this peripheral experience had been stripped from music under the dictatorship of a single white button iPods make it easy to listen to music by making it invisible and intangible. We are starting, we start by giving back the simple joy of seeing an entire wall of music covers all at the same time. We put the memorabilia on a tapestry of PVC envelopes hanging six meters above the floor. Of course, you can't really see much of anything when the records are so far away. So we have a pair of robotic cameras which track across the two sides of the wall of records, CDs, and books. To see B side is to touch it, to assume the role of DJ by standing at one of the control tables, tweaking the joystick and watching the robotic stars sway and jump in response while its umbilical wires dance and drag across the floor of the music. The twin cameras move together to show the A and B sides of each object on two CRTs. But there are two tables, each with a joystick. If two people play at the same time, they can cancel each other out or reinforce each other's movements. B side preserves and re-emphasizes the bilateral symmetry of a vinyl record and the human ego system which has been so essential to the recorded music industry, inspiring the structure of albums, record, record jacket, and hardware. This is an absolutely analog machine, not quite predictable. The stylus which holds the cameras can swing a little bit, never going exactly where the operator wants it to. It's noisy, flawed, physical. <coughs> Operators never look at the CRTs, of course, they always look at the moving cameras, <coughs> a rare victory of mechanical over luminous reality. To play with B-side is very public. The whole store is watching you and the or the robot you <coughs> control. 
they know what the insect you are looking at. And they know if you are any good at operating the machine. When we lecture to students in Bangkok, we show them a lot of process photos because we want them to appreciate that drawing is not enough. Someone has to figure out how to make it work. We want to, them to appreciate that that someone includes us. Thai culture and the low cost of labor causes class separation even in design work. In a typical firm, there are draftsmen with drafting degrees and model makers and account executives and architects. We don't see how architecture can function this way. You can't design without drawing. You can't draw something without having some idea of how it fits together. This is a basic value system that we learned in American schools that is just not part of the Thai system. It's important for us, for our students, to see that we actually do work. Design is work, sometimes boring, sometimes exhausting, sometimes enormously fun, but work nonetheless. Now, you may have wondered who some of these celebrities are that get their CDs and knickknacks inclined. Well, some of them are popular musicians with potentially interesting music habits. Others are just high selves which is the second word in our Thai vocabulary series. Thai society. Like having a few thousand Hilton sisters, they exist to be photographed and interviewed for magazines and TV programs. They don't work and really need to have a reason to dress up and go out at night. Meanwhile, marketing agencies need to turn their product launches and store openings into spectacles. So they invite high sales, along with singers and actresses, to give their events some glamour. Different consumer brands bring out different styles of high sales. Younger hip hop types would go to a Nokia product launch, while old money types would go to the launch of a diamond covered watch from Europe. Each event needs to be uniquely decorated as a backdrop for high sale photography session. We are trapped in the middle of this immense cycle, but it's, it gives us a tremendous opportunity for interference, an opportunity for to add something into a, an existing system that we think is of greater interest than the status quo. Following the success of the music event, this same department store decided to fill the same void with the same formula. This time there would be a hundred celebrities and we would display their favorite toys. Obviously, the 100 celebrities will show up for the opening event, and many will bring dates. With 200 young and trendy high sales guaranteed, every magazine, newspaper, and TV show will send a cameraman to photograph each high sale with his or her toy. We realized that we could use this backdrop for social engineering and turn these events into a real party with possibly a fight. We stretch this toy display case into an irrational zigzag that fills up the atrium's plan, starting at a 1.25 meter datum. We fill it with toys and label it with celebrity photos, and it invites this labyrinthian walk. But sooner or later, everyone gets frustrated and ducks below the case. Everyone becomes like a child again, we explain to the client. But there's another agenda. Thai social hierarchies have a very literal connection to physical elevation. In greeting, the younger you are, or the lower ranked, the lower so, the further down your head dips. At an extreme end of the scale, a commoner lays down before the king. We made even high cells dip their heads or risk decapitation. All of these transparent reflective surfaces made cameras impossible to autofocus and encouraged awkward one-way eye contact. The display was photogenic, but it made it very difficult to take portraits of specific celebrities. He's a celebrity. <laughs> we had noticed that on weekends, a lot of parents actually started bringing their young children to the store. So on a Saturday morning, there, there's 20, 30 kids tearing the place up. We liked the idea that 
toys were all out of their reach because we're mean. They can run around <laughs> all they want, but they can't get to us. So DT tells V equals 1.25 to be toy-like in its construction. Joining plates inspired by construction toys, steel legs were that look a lot thinner than most adults could are comfortable with. Joined with the wooden floor with colorful suction cups. And we gave the kids some real toys, which they could race around on the wide open floor after they fought each other for the remote control unit. Architecture is quite often thought of as a container. People in program go inside of it. This is content. In this case, our work is the content inside of a more permanent container by the designers of the store. But our work is also a container for something else, for toys or music memorabilia. In this context, our containers won't stand as interesting objects on their own. They are not really content. They actually do need to be filled with celebrity toys in order to have the effect we've shown you. But unlike most of what we would call exhibition design, we're not especially respectful of this content. Our intent is not the communication of the content. Our containers actually get in the way. They stand between the content and its viewer. They function like a pretty. You can't help but look at it. We dis content. We aren't interested in some actress's Barbie collection, and we don't think many people really are. But the content is an effective catalyst. By a social convention, it is an acceptable filler of space and time. A hundred toys and some publicity got these people together to socialize in the middle of a department store and generated lots and lots of content for all these publications. It gave us the opportunity to contain and entertain them to make a spectacle of a social environment we find a little bit weird. We are cynics, but not pessimists. We discontent, but we are not discontent. We do this kind of work because we believe we have something to contribute to these situations, hopefully to change them. We go into this work with our own agenda, which is not exactly our client's agenda, but it's usually not in complete conflict either. The bottom line is, our clients want people in the space and want them to experience something new and worth talking about. We want the same thing. Many of the most lovingly designed containers in our country are hotels. Designer hotels are a buzzword worldwide. But tourism is such a huge part of Thailand's economy, it should be no surprise that new hotels spring up everywhere and old hotels are getting facelifts. This is Nylert Park Hotel, a 60s monstrosity, uh, recently overhauled by Calvin Sao. We were asked to make content for this new glass wall which divides the hotel bar from its lobby. We made a three-channel video which is projected onto a special film which is transparent until light hits it at the right angle. It's viewed from both sides and would run all day for a few years, so the content is needed to be very universal. So we looked at the things that have always been used as content in public places. These are things that are visually interesting but don't really mean anything. They allow other content to flow past them. You can sit in a European square with a fountain in the middle of it and have a conversation about anything. The fountain is a kind of social enabler. It attracts people to come into the space and then it gives them a license to sit and do nothing, stare at the fountain, talk, do drugs, whatever. It doesn't ask you to talk about it, and it has nothing to say to you. But it works. It really gets you to use the space. And it also conveniently fills up the space when there aren't any people in it. We call it non-tent, and we respect its ancient power as a social catalyst. So we made this list of time-tested non-tent. Moving liquids, fire, alcohol, small animals, and chain them together in a looping, morphing animation that takes about four hours to fully repeat. A series of alcoholic beverages are poured in slow motion and gradually transform into psychedelic, dancing, bubbling, colorful fluids. Then the liquids are replaced by Siamese fighting fish, which have this sort of sexy, slow, flowing dance about them. 
the fish turn into candles, the candles start to screen on fire, and the whole thing begins again with a different set of glasses, drinks, liquids, fish, and fire. For several months after its renovation, the hotel wasn't doing well financially. So religious consultants were brought in and suggested changes to the design. Our Siamese fighting fish were considered too violent. So we issued a more we issued a more peaceful version. We were lucky here. We were able to use superstition to make something more abstract and modern. It's more often that modern, modernism suffers. The hotel restaurant are now, now has red lights. The lobby has umbrellas and tacky flowers arrangement. And the front drive now has this golden shrine in the middle of it. Modern buildings often end up having nostalgic decorations tacked onto them with cli by clients, severely weakening nearly every architect's attempt at finding a meaningful contemporary aesthetic. Superstition is certainly not unique to Thailand, though it may have more obvious visual implications there. We don't like it, but we try to wrestle it into something that is a force that we can deal with, the way, say, architecture has always dealt with gravity. But it's nothing like gravity. You can count on gravity. Gods and ghosts are fickle, jealous, and arbitrary. Here's a family having a religious uh, ceremony, traditional, at the laying of the first post of their house. In a reinforced concrete structure, that strangely means the first rebar cage, although some say it means the first foundation pile. In this millennium, there can be no doubt what's going to hold this house up. It's not the animist land spirit these people are praying to. It's steel. The steel gets hidden in concrete, and the prayers are mostly invisible too. But I think you can sense the force of gravity that's acting on this house, and I say it is good. There is this other force, I'll call it the reactionary force, that influences our built environment. It changed the design of this house. There was supposed to be a big steel entrance door, kind of on the right side here, underneath the concrete fin, <coughs> lined up with the staircase. But after the design was complete and construction already started, a consultant told our client that you can't have a door that lines up with a stair. And incidentally, the door would need to be exactly 1.47 meters wide. The door could not be where it was supposed to be. That is a fact as real as gravity. So we walled up the entrance door, and you'll just go in and out of the house through what we had been calling windows. <laughs> it's quite large windows. It'll be OK. <coughs> we, we could have taken the concrete ledge out of the design we operate in this sort of functionalist vein, and the ledge was only there because it was part of the door, but we deliberately left it. We've been to so many lectures where the architect wistfully shows us his design the way he actually designed it, and he tells us how much better it was than the finished product because of money or clients or building codes, and it's depressing. This vestigial concrete fin, this sign of a door that will never be, is giving that lecture for us. It's registering the reactionary force. You see the fin, the pocket cut out of the other side of that wall, and the stairs. And some of you will realize that there should have been a door there. It was thwarted by the invisible hand. Our client might right now well be telling someone why that fin is there. It'll always be there. And we got this non-functional, aesthetically pleasing concrete fin for free a more interesting reason to talk to you about this house. Win-win. When our architect friends visit us in Bangkok, there's always this moment when they get really cautious and quiet and say, what do you think of Bangkok's architecture? And we have to laugh. It's terrible, sometimes beautifully terrible. There are some great palaces and temples from the 19th century. The robot building on the right is probably the country's best known, most talked about modern building. And we don't want to talk about it. 
By comparison, Thailand's contemporary fashion is world class, and the interiors of some of its high-end shops, restaurants, and hotels have a freshness that seems to bear no relation to the buildings that contain them. These interiors should be understood not as an aspect of architecture, which in Thailand is a very distinct profession from interior design, <coughs> but as an extension of clothing. Thai fashion in, is many years ahead of Thai architecture, and this is easily explainable. Bangkok is a sprawling, unzoned urban mess, where there's no point of showing off your wealth and taste with a nice house, because it's probably too far away for anyone to come and visit. But, you buy an, but if you buy a nice outfit, you can wear it to work, for shopping, or an event in a shopping mall. Bangkok is hot and humid. If you are outdoors in Bangkok, you are uncomfor uncomfortable. And that's just no way that a nice facade is going to help make you feel differently. Many Thais live in, live in large households with their extended families, and many businesses are family run. That's never just one client for an architectural project. A client grandfather will also have a say in what the house or store or office looks like. But each individual can wear what they want. In a big family that lives and works together, clothing might be the only means of self-expression available to an individual member. Like many local building industry in the world, ours is riddled with corruption, driving up prices, driving down quality, driving even the best intentioned architects to give up faster. Massive government projects have been promoting the fashion industry in the past decade, trying to style Bangkok as the Milan of Southeast Asia. It can't compete with China with, for cheap textiles, but its educated, wealthy, western influence youth culture creates a lot of designers. It has the right combination of higher quality standards and exportable design to create a healthy fashion industry. Architecture doesn't get this kind of attention because buildings can't really be exported. The cultural milieu of young, forward-looking architects in Thailand has more in common with the arts that are aligned to fashion and advertising rather than building and construction. So we end up with these projects that we would like to call architectural that are sited within a vast interior world of giant shopping malls in interconnected with air-conditioned bridges and sky trains and attached to parking structures. This project is a display of fashion photography featuring local celebrities as models. To give you some perspective, the architect of the robot building and his DJ son are among the models. We think it's interesting that this event manages to collapse several legs in the cultural production cycle on top of each other. It uses designers as models in photographs not meant to be spread out in magazines, but concentrated in time and space like a catwalk runway show. The, uh, the unveiling of the photos, of course, is also an event where the same people and photographer attend to be photographed admiring pictures of themselves wearing the same clothes just a few steps from the cashier counter where the clothes that they're wearing are sold. This is a narcissistic point of purchase cluster festival. The only thing missing is any sign of the clothes actually being made. That little segment of the production cycle is glossed over as if the whole world was only this. Design, advertise, consume. Design, advertise, consume. Everything is so smooth and shiny and confident. We wanted to add some element of self-awareness to the mix. So we mounted the photographs on mirrors. The mirrors let the photographs look at themselves in case their subjects don't happen to be there in person. But they also reflect the retail environment collapsing the art onto the same picture frame as the merchandise. Everything is advertising. The mechanism rotates, occasionally creating a wall of mirrors or photos, more often reflecting themselves, distorting, rearranging the store's merchandise and shoppers. It is interactive, 
in the sense that its motion is triggered by people walking past various points of the story. But its relationship to the viewer is often counterintuitive. It's as likely to suddenly turn and block your path as it, as it is to open for you. You feel like it responds to you, and it does, and then suddenly it's behaving randomly or responding to someone else. Like fashion, its vitality has changed. It distracts and redirects customers, often physically blocking their passage or pushing them along. Is it art? We're not interested. As far as the people going into this are concerned, this is a photography exhibition. If there's any art to be seen, it's the photographs or maybe the clothing design. We made a picture frame here. There are a handful of people who come to this because they know we did it and they're fans or whatever. And if you ask them, they might call it installation art or something similar. Of course, we're conditioned to call it architecture, but we are totally okay with it being infrastructure. It might do some of the things that art does, but it absolutely needs to be in this shopping mall to work, which is a severe limitation. It's not art, but it is site specific. It was designed to be oversized in exactly this space, and you can never get far enough away to look at it. You are always within it. It's detailed to simultaneously complement and precise the industrial chic store fixtures. Without being surrounded by an array of shiny things and famed people, it would lose its meaning. Its content is its container and its audience. But we don't want you to think we aren't interested in fine art or that Bangkok doesn't support a contemporary art scene. We are, and it does. One of the major preoccupations of Bangkok's art world in our time has been the tennis position of Bangkok's art world. Here, in a show called Free Parking, we protested against a Bangkok governor who wanted to change the previous government's project to build a contemporary art museum into a venue generating parking structure. We transformed a university gallery into a parking structure using the conventions of, this, of the construction industry. Thailand is famously colorful kitschy and exotic. This Thainess, I didn't make that word up, is actively promoted by the government to benefit the tourist and export industries. Traditionalist aesthetics are so predominant that Thai artists are almost compelled to address them. This is Thailand's first official pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 2003, not by us. It's a tent shaped like traditional Thai architecture with a constant schedule of Thai activities like cooking, massage, and dances going on in front. The organizers were tempting irony here. They were intentionally offering for Western eyes an erotic, orientalized version of Thailand, not as a statement about Thailand, but as a statement about the West. But the joke was on them. The irony was completely lost. The pavilion only ended up reinforcing the perception of Thailand as an unsophisticated, underdeveloped culture. This is very serious business. So we jumped at an opportunity to portray Thai homosexuality for a show in Lund Kunsthall, Sweden. Western perceptions of Thailand very often have this strong sexual element. Prostitutes, soapy massage parlors, mail order brides, prosthetic enhancements, medical products, lady boys, ping pong shows, and so on. Sex and kitsch are inseparable in the way that Thailand advertises itself to the outside world. This is a show of research by Sopawan Wunmihik, including text, short films, photography, and curatorial work. Sopawan wants to reinvigorate Western queer studies by adding a Thai word to its vocabulary, lakapit lakapit. Literally, it means oscillating between on and off, open and closed. But it has many less binary connotations in Thai, 
including a slang term for homosexuals. The term is also the driving idea behind our design for the exhibition, which, has, which was made in Thailand and brought to Sweden as checked baggage. We used a kind of modernized version of a traditional Thai mosquito net to, pat to partially enclose the pieces in the exhibition. It's like a bit like a flap. Each piece of furniture within the exhibition has some degree of ambiguity or mild schizophrenia. It's a little bit inside out or upside down or domestic public. The gallery's straight walls and floor are barely touched by the artwork. They speak a different language. But Sopawan's very long text written in Western academic prose is placed there. It begins straight, but keeps getting pulled out of line as it points toward the works that it refers to inside the mosquito tent. The floor ends up being lots of angular lines of dense academic text, which invite skipping around and rearranging. We observed that Switzerland, or Switzerland either actually, Sweden. Sweden is not very much like Thailand. It's dark, cold, monochrome, reserved. People sit down and watch half hour long art videos there. We prefab this exhibition in Thailand because it's obviously cheaper, but it was soon clear that it would have been logistically impossible for us to do this in Sweden. The materials and methods we've come to use come from a culture of advertising they are how billboards, light boxes, and banners are made especially. This work is very easy to access in Bangkok. This is an excerpt from a typical Thai decorating show with my partner as the week's guest. Here she is showing viewers where to go to get plastic bent. People love to find related media in Thailand and they love to interview everyone Every interviewer asks the same question. Why do you go to for inspiration? We always give the same canned answer. We go here to the markets. Where shopping malls are as monotonous as they are in the US, the market sells everything. Toys, edible insects, stationery, industrial machinery, all on the same street. Here's something they sell on street corners in touristy areas. Plastic bands with blinking LEDs in the blades. We love the psychedelic effect and the intensely simple way it works. But it looks unhappy packaged as a toy that some kid, for some kid to throw away after a night. So we undertook this project to make an environment where LED fans could be appreciated as we love them. To li liberate technology from tacky. We bought hundreds of them, stripped them from their plastic handles and rewired them to bare electric, electrical wires. We kept a tunnel around a group of them for guests to walk through on their way into a performance sponsored by an internet provider. The fans were very popular with children. It's wonderful how willing Thai parents are to let their kids touch bare electrical wires and stick, <laughs> and stick their fingers into moving fan blades and photographers and child photographers. But photographs don't really capture it. They don't give you the breeze they generate or the insect-like sound of a few hundred fans or the slightly irregular movement. It looks good in pictures, but it feels good in reality. We think this, that is exactly where this kind of design should be. It needs to still give some reason for people to come out and experience it. We have recycled this idea three times, once as an event, once as art in a gallery, and once as a stage set. Now it's retired. This business of removing consumer electronics from their cases 
you might see it as an attempt at transparency because we're exposing how they work, kind of. But in the context we're operating in, I think we're actually striving for a kind of opacity. We're concealing the identity of the fans as a mass-produced toy. Either way, we do it to the fans here and elsewhere. You've seen us doing it to things like TV sets. Because first and foremost, we want to remove branding and commercial signifiers to turn this stuff into something more than consumer bling. We don't want you to see our work as just a bunch of stuff that you can buy and put together, even though obviously it's a bunch of stuff you could buy and put together. That aspect of it really isn't that interesting and we don't want you to think about it. We want more people to appreciate what we've done with it, the experience we've created. The second reason, frankly, is shameless tech fetishism. This is certainly a cliche in the West, but not in Thailand where transparency is so counter to the mode of art and design that we think it means something different there. We really do want kids to see something they haven't seen before in hopes that they'll find as much joy in taking apart their world as we do. Their formal education will never encourage them to see something as beautiful because of the way it works. We also do the opposite. If technology isn't yet banal, we push it towards magic. Revelation is a series of benches we made for a shopping mall. Most malls have physical, uncomfortable benches to keep people from resting too long. Ours are psychological, psychologically uncomfortable. They have this inviting white glow until you sit on them. At the very moment you want to retreat, the glass goes clear and you are revealed. Maybe you match the polka dots fabric lining, prob but probably not. You are revealed, technology is not. No wires, no lights, no sensors, no wheels, no switches. We spend months fighting for minimalism, doing our own engineering for structural mitic glass corner. We, were, we are making an iPod, we kept telling contractors. Every year, we hear a figure like this one. The average Thai person reads six lines of text per year. That statistic is not verifiable, but <laughs> there seems to be a bit of truth to it. They buy a lot of fashion, lifestyle, interior design magazines. The last time we checked, wallpaper has, was published in three editions, English, Russian, and Thai. We occasionally write, edit, advise, and interview for Art4D magazine, which is aimed at producers more than consumers of design. Excellent printing and good graphic design, we try to help its content to push writing to be more thoughtful and less press release. It's very cheap at about a dollar an issue, which means students can afford it. It's cheap because it's funded by suppliers of building products. Building products and art for D also advertise at trade shows, which are major cultural events in Bangkok. Architecture grad students go to them with their families. You would go. It seems like almost everyone has some connection to a product that is imported or exported, or they're dreaming of it and go to check out the competition. People go to meet their friends, enjoy free air conditioning, and hang out in the spectacle. This is the Plan of Impact Challenger. It's the largest column-free exhibition hall in the world, 120 by 500 meters. An architect drew this as one of the largest blank interior plans on the planet and said, someone put something else here. Mm. At the annual Architects Expo, Art4D gets a free little piece of real estate, which it uses to sell books and back issues to collectors and serve free espresso. With no real pressure to sell because their space is free, and because the magazine has developed a community of designers around it, Art40 usually invites the designers and architects to make something to be sold or given away in the booth. So one year we made belts, another year we made crackers, and this is great fun. Um, sorry, I lost my hand. 
response is, was now cracker, by the way. Uh, it reinforces the idea that you go to an architect for useless toys. If you want architecture, meaning a building, you go to a trade show and buy stuff out of catalogs. And we really wanted the architect's role in the architecture fairs booth for an architecture magazine to be more integral to something like architecture, something related to the booth's function, meaning, and experience. So we suggested stairs. We'd build a platform for selling books and coffee, and we issue a building code to give to other designers who would make stairs and ladders for getting onto the platform. Most building products at a trade show li like this are extremely ugly finishing materials, like wood grain ceramic tiles. Booths are mostly made from a toxic assembly of cardboard, bondo, and spray paint in an attempt to emulate the smooth Boolean masses of SketchUp. We wanted our booth to inspire this love of honest, functional materials. We were especially pleased with our blacksmith's craftsmanship. By the time we got through Bangkok traffic to reach the site, he had already been there for a couple of hours and had reached substantial completion while most of our neighbors hadn't even started. There was a point in the design process when it looked like not a single designer was going to give us a safe, practical ladder. So we ended up having to build a stair ourselves along the backside after all. She's the only one who was successful to climb that one. <laughs> It was our intent to leave this lower level as an empty footprint. All of the other booths are paying enormous amounts of money to rent this little piece of space, and they have to cram as much into their real estate as they can. We have this luxury of donated leftover space, and we wanted to show it off. But the platform and the stair were constantly packed, and we would find people hanging out in the darkness under here, having little picnics. In a climate of rabid real estate speculation, like these condo towers that are going up in Bangkok like everywhere else, it's occasionally nice to find a space that content has somehow missed. Quantum even. Ghost buildings are massive condo developments that were in construction when the 1997 financial crisis bankrupted their backers and contractors. Over the past five years, some have, have been torn down or given a new skin in the latest architectural style, but there are still so many left. Where Americans would say, not in my backyard, I say, not my problem. This is a well-documented nationwide obsession with smooth, clean, perfect, opaque finishes. It extends from fashion and manicures and whitening skin treatments to construction techniques, facial expressions, and political structure. In this context, the unfinished finish means something different. When most of your life is in such high-gloss, hyper-photographed, controlled interior environments, entropy is cozy. So we're building this concrete house. It's not finished yet, but it's a lot more finished than the neighbors realize. The workers themselves are sometimes baffled by what we've asked for, they are fiercely proud of their ability to render a very smooth surface with plastic. It's surprisingly difficult to communicate this. It's very easy to say that you want something infinitely straight, level, and smooth. But how do you say, I want it to look natural and rough, but not too sloppy, by saying as little as possible? We think that this is one of the ways that Brutalism 1.0 went wrong. When architects started getting so picky 
and personally picking out the wood for the formwork and arranging it and trying so hard to overdetermine the outcome of something that they wanted supposedly to look a little bit indeterminate. They were depriving the process of an important bit of its nature. There is a point where you have to let go. We said bare concrete, scrap wood format, formwork, and I can say we truly got something we did not plan on. Our Thai architect friends see pictures of this house under construction and they all say the same thing. Who's your contractor? Thai contractors don't know how to make nice concrete. And we have to ask, are you looking at the same pictures we are? This is terrible concrete. There's bubbles, exposed aggregate, it's not from. They took some of the formwork off too early. The corners don't line up, the wood joints aren't evenly spaced and it's awesome. <laughs> we had an intern this summer who every time he saw a new material, he would ask, how would you render that? <laughs> and it seems like such a joyless worldview to me. We do spend most of our time sitting at a computer screen, but given an opportunity for a physical experience, we're gonna take it, not attempt to simulate it. A material that can't effectively be rendered seems like just the thing we ought to be using. You can render the bathroom. <laughs> Dogs like it. Hi, Dean of Star Casting. Most of the renderings we are, we see aren't being used for architectural intent. They are the advertising tools for property developers who target the least imaginative customers. This next project was commissioned by a property developer as part of the promotion for a condo tower being built called Nano. As with every such project, the marketing angle was something like this. You can live in the, city, in the big city, but shut it outside and have your own private oasis. Personal space loosely fits this description. It subdivides a public space into rooms, accessed by a shared circulation route. Each room has a bed-like chair and a fabric tube to ensure that no one else can look at your piece of sky but you. Like all advertisers, we lie to our customers. This environment is much more a device for putting people together than separating them. Yes, it has walls, but no clear lines of demarcation between my space and yours. There are no property lines, no doors, gates, or thresholds. The halls are most clearly shared at their narrowest points, where it's actually not possible for two people to pass. There are personal spaces. When you come across another visitor who has staked a claim on a, one of the beds, you feel invasive. It's a transgression that you have to acknowledge. It's a condition more in intimate than running into your condo neighbor in an elevator lobby. We usually explain that this project is a cynical critique of condo projects because we enjoy the reaction this gets from a Bangkok student audience. I think it's very badass. <laughs> but the truth is, I think this is a very optimistic project. This is a social enabler. And maybe a hint at how you could try to live more interestingly in your condo. The lines we've drawn are for drawing people together. We are observing a cynical environment around us. Compare our lines to these lines. It's the land deed for a two-floor condo with three parking spots. This is a very cynical document. Its hard-inked lines and tiny, tiny measurements are so pessimistic and untrusting. This is mine. That is yours. That column beneath the paint belongs to the condo corporation's juristic person. It's silly. And as near as I can tell, I can build on those parking spaces. 
broken beer bottles embedded in the top of a wall, a very common wall type around uh, houses in Thailand. That's pretty cynical. Redundant walls between identical abject spaces with different owners, cynical. I have to admit that putting a fence over the group of your house seems cynical, <laughs> but I think this one is actually a little bit more complicated than my other examples. You can look at these iron bars as symptoms of paranoia, and I think that's true. But they've got some built-in irony as well. I hope, like our personal space project, they are elegantly self-defeating. They make it a little bit harder to break in, but much, much easier to climb. <laughs> so if your neighbor gets a full building fence wrap, you need one too. Did the whole district get their security system at the same time? Same contractor? There's some variation, but enough similarity that there must have been some degree of collaboration or community involvement in this paranoia. Look at how the fences and structure are most often shared by neighbors, not built as independent, redundant structures. The bars have an ugly toughness, sure, but it's countered by their kitschy decorative quality. They are every bit as sweet as they are mean. They might have been installed nominally for security, but they've adopted other uses, as plant hangers and attachment points for TV satellites. These are not property lines. They're party walls, registrations of a weird kind of relationship that I think Bangkok does especially well. This kind of building, we call it a shop house, is nothing special. They are the most perfectly dumb little building type possible four meter grid of reinforced concrete, masonry walls. A typical building is three bays deep and three to six stories tall. Each building shares structure with two huge but very thin walls with the buildings on the other side. The front facade is usually a sign that would make Venturi proud or envious. The back facade, strangely, is never a sign, even when it's visible. St stubbornly undecorated, undesigned messes of plumbing, repairs, laundry, and random windows. Undecorated sheds, totally unselfconscious functionalism. Unlike a similar building in New York, the back of a shop house usually does not face the back of another shop house. Typically, a row of buildings is built by a large property owner as a wall to protect their compound from the street while generating income. But of course, the wall that they built to protect themselves from the street is what made the street. 30 years pass, and the big landowner's view is this. But all of those dumb buildings have a gorgeous view of the landowner's lush landscaped garden. It's karma. The immigrant families who bought the cheapest, smallest, buildings they could 30 or 40 years ago to run tiny little shops are now quite well off, even before you count the value of their 4 by 16 meter piece of land. Shop houses are born of cynical line drawing, but they always accumulate these optimistic complications, like unwitting land redistribution. Shop houses are not special. It's their greatest strength. They have no historical, architectural, or even sentimental value. You can buy a shop house, you can tear it down. No protests, no letters to the editor, no preservation districts. I love shop houses, and even I won't complain. Shop houses do not stand in the way of the future. But we think you should change your shop house. Their dumb, generic qualities invite a pattern of endless user modifications. Shop houses are like artificial reefs of urbanity. The facades and roofs naturally promote unlikely juxtapositions of form and use. Uses will change. The original model of a shop on the ground floor with a house above for the shopkeeper's family is not suddenly going to come back into fashion. But a ground floor architect studio with rental apartments on the upper three floors 
could work just fine. So we've become a tiny little real estate developer in Bangkok Central Business District, a condition only made possible because two generations ago, someone decided to subdivide their property into impossibly small slices. We're changing this shop house to fit a more contemporary use pattern. The first problem we had to circumvent is that you typically have to walk through the shop to get to the house because the stairs are at the back all the way up. So we move them to the front so there can be a separate entrance for the upstairs tenants. As anyone who lives in a New York tenement building knows, this results in a very long, narrow, dark hallway. So we paint the stairs safety orange and open up the back end to our neighbor's garden. The stair you saw in the section, it's in the wrong place on every single floor. Almost one third of each floor is typically lost to circulation. And it's the best part, the part with the windows over facing the, the rich guy's garden. So we start surgically modifying each floor plate so that this floor takes up less valuable space and allows each floor to have an apartment with openings at both ends. On the second floor, shown at the top here, it needs a bathroom that can be left open. and we're forced to put a bedroom in the windowless middle bay. Fortunately, this apartment transforms from a studio to a one bedroom. And since our shop house happens to be on the end of the row, we che cheat a few little porthole windows in, located behind our neighbor's trees so he never knows we did it. <laughs> when we say shop house upper floor, Everybody has a very visceral reaction in Bangkok. This is probably the best of what they could possibly be picturing. A lot of childhood traumas in room like, rooms like this. <laughs> but it's not fair to blame the shop house. So we continue our way through the building upwards, carving new staircases out of the building's mass and then on each floor, twisting an apartment layout to fit around it, resulting in every floor being different, which is not how shop houses are. That's someone else's tree. A typical shop house usually has at least a little hut added onto the roof. You can see our neighbors on the right. Alice has not yet arrived. But the plastic surgeon's office next door, who built the little hut, he's convinced that we hate shop houses because we tried so hard to make ours look different. Of course, we love shop houses, and making yours look different is part of what shop houses are. Our facade does its best to strip the shop house down to the diagram that we love. Difference is normal. Atypical is typical. There's nothing you can do to a shop house that makes it not a shop house. The most radical thing that you could try to do, almost to the point of violating the type, would be to mess with the four meter party wall spacing. The project we're beginning now, a few houses down, We'll do just that to three adjoining units. It's going to be a budget hotel. The four meter grid is not optimized for guest rooms in a budget hotel. Three meters would be perfect, giving us 33% more rooms, each at the minimum code size of nine square meters. Of course, the best rooms are in the back where the stairs used to be, so we need to find a place to put the stairs, obviously in the middle. But we need to fit the main stair and a fire stair, plus circulation and utilities, in that leftover middle bay. So we use scissors stairs. One is dedicated as an enclosed fire stair, the other is open. 
The next step is obviously to begin exploring the consequences of this syncopation. Such as oddly complicated double staircase that comes out of this. The codes are different for the main and fire stairs, resulting in non-parallel intertwined flights. And the fact that we have to add a complete set of uh, beams to hold up the new three meter party walls means the building will have two superimposed structural grids, the existing four meter grid of beams that engaged in their slabs and a new group of beams at three meters, which will be poured above the slabs because there's no way to pour concrete below an existing slab. So the new three meter wall beams are gonna sit on top of the slab with the wall on top of that, making a very strange wall type. Um, and giving us this opportunity to add seismic details to a construction method that doesn't usually do very well in an earthquake. And of course, we'll have to find a facade design that reinforces the type by violating it. Now, our shop house interventions are small. Maybe you think it takes a lot of nerve to give a Wednesday night lecture at Columbia and start talking about rise and run of fire stairs. I think I saw some people leaving. Or preaching the psychological benefits of pedestrian pockets and the live work lifestyle. Well, we are guilty. But if it makes you feel any be better, there's another way of looking at this typology and it's a lot less cute. A century ago, this was mostly an empty swamp land with rice fields. Bangkok didn't have roads, it had canals. The Venice of the East, they called it. Over just a few decades, they filled in all of it and completely covered it with these hideous cement row houses. Imagine what these construction sites must have looked like. I've been calling each four by 16 meter plot a building. The people who were building them would have called 10 or 20 of those a building. But we could just e easily understand each street as a building or a pretty big chunk of central Thailand is one massive building. This was an aggressive, unsentimental building project, much bigger than the current high-rise condo craze. More concrete, more workers, more formwork. It's not enough to understand these as individual buildings. Shop houses are very literally the urban fabric of this megacity. They affect its social conventions, its transportation, even its climate. They are part of its problems, and they will have to be a part of its solutions. We're showing you a view of Bangkok that only became available in 1999 when the SkyTrain began running. At speed and elevation, you begin to get a feel for shop houses as a dystopic megastructure. Keep in mind that the land along the SkyTrain route is the first to have its shop houses demolished for taller buildings. Still, typically a third or more of what we're looking at is shop house mass. In the vast majority of the city, not on the train route, there's a much higher density of shop houses than what we're looking at here. If we were to move this camera 12 meters down to the level of the bus on the street, we'd be seeing something much different. Shoppers and hawkers, messengers on motorbikes, hot pink cab drivers hopped up on meth and that's real too. But you need both. This is no new urbanist pedestrian pocket and it never could be. The sidewalk's vitality is generated as much by the sprawling highways choked with commuters and diesel fumes as anything else. To understand this city, you need to see it in motion. We think that what makes a good city or a good trade fair is not the quality of the buildings or booths which compose it, but the quality and interest of the movement it invites. Next step is a celebration of circulation. It's an exhibition house commissioned as the centerpiece of a fair sponsored by Thailand's House and Garden magazine. The structure just barely touches the exhibition hall's floor straddling the intersection between two main aisles between booths. This allows the house to seemingly be visible from everywhere. But more importantly, it invites people to walk beneath it, 
incorporating them into its composition, whether they are coming to see the house or deliberately walking past it. It's difficult to walk casually past, since it seems to float overhead at an acute angle, rather than squatting in the mean grid of cardboard walls and excessive light that trade shows cultivate. Next step is positioned, a skew of the commercial booths, stretching out diagonally above its plaza to emphasize that the ground beneath it is not like the rest of the fair. It's a space for entertainment, a space for talking to strangers, not a space for hard sales. The interior of next step is a staircase with its steps stretched out to define surfaces for the rituals of everyday life parking, cooking, eating, entertaining, cleaning, and sleeping. These serve the functions we've come to expect of our archetypal rooms, but are arranged in a very strict sequence to emphasize the relationships between them with the diagram of the house constantly reinscribed on the inhabitant's lifestyle. The spaces are not separated by walls, but by a series of steps between them, beckoning visitors to climb to the next step more private, familiar functions at the top end of the house are divided by fewer steps, so the experience of moving from room to room becomes more comfortable in the homier, more private spaces. At each transition, one or more steps is stretched to become a definitive furniture element, like kitchen counters, a cantilever dining table, the living room couch, ending with the top step as a bed. A continuous shelf, divided to address both the horizontal plane of the steps and the incline of the house's structure, lines one wall. Its depth increases gradually towards the top of the house, falling into deeper shadows as the spaces become more private. Next steps, material palette and detailing are inspired by the technical demonstrations that are common at this kind of fair, like walls built as section cutaways so you can see how the structure, cladding, and insulation are related. We use only materials ubiquitous in local construction, but we try to use them in slightly different ways. Some are hidden, some that are usually hidden are used in a very direct manner, like OSB and a ceiling made of tufted fiberglass insulation. Engineered wood flooring is left exposed at its edges, revealing its man-made technical nature instead of hiding behind an edge veneer. Walls are paneled in three shades of translucent polycarbonate and expanded metal, which filter the color, which filter the color in the lights of the fair outside, not quite blocking them out, but dimming them into a pleasant abstraction. In presenting the house, we try to emphasize that it's much more than a collection of materials. We display our drawing set for the house on the dining room table as a reminder that this object didn't just happen on its own. People made it. In the same spirit, we display a carpenter's level on the bookshelf. It is indeed perfectly flat, and photos of the house's fabrication and assembly in the picture frames. Next step is an exhibition house, an equal measure of exhibition and house. It's meant as a kind of performance art, an inspirational entertainment for the visitors to play with and fantasize about while they take a break from the tedium of shopping. But it's also intended as a provocation, a prod to get people to ask themselves, do I really need this big heavy house filled with furniture I don't use? Sited so far away I can't leave without a car? Do I really need to cut my house into tiny little air-conditioned rooms and seal myself off from the outdoors? Do I really need my brick wall topped with broken beer bottles? Do I want kids? Presented as a model house to a very mass audience, it's challenging. We were happy enough to be able to make it and didn't have very high hopes for intelligent feedback. We were wrong. 
we've been severely underestimating the so-called ordinary consumers. An astonishing number of people wanted to buy one. But this was a site-specific piece meant to sit in a carpeted exhibition hall for 10 days. It was never meant as a prototype for mass production and permanent outdoor use. So we had to just choose one home for the house that we already had. We sold it back to the guy we hired to build it, who was putting it up behind his mom's house. <laughs> Question? Because they couldn't tweet, Mark. In a lot of cases. It depends on the people I'm building for. Um, look what they do for a living. I really don't think that what we want is uh, very often so much in conflict with them. If we truly are trying to do something different from what they want, it's not going to work out. Um, the clients I'm talking about aren't people building their houses, typically. It's vast boardrooms full of indecisive people. What they want, whether they are able to say it or not, is someone to make the decision for them and make it happen. Sometimes we're able to do that for them. I don't really see it as a conflict. designing each other. When, uh, when we give a lecture a little bit like this in, in Thailand, very often we're delivering it to classes taught by people who, well, went to Columbia. Um, And when their students don't have questions and they have to come up with questions for us, they all they can think of is to put this kind of New York spin on it, like, wouldn't you rather be back in America or something like that? <laughs> and uh, basically, no. Um, I get to do this in Bangkok, and I, I don't know what I would be doing if I were here, but it probably wouldn't be this. Having a good time. Yeah, I think we missed Bangkok already. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not to say we necessarily like Bangkok. It's a sort of uh, symbiosis, codependence. In 2021? I can 
think we are. Um, you know, it's not like we ever liked the titties and the high sows, but there was a point when they made us so mad that it gave us energy to do something about it. And frankly, we're a bit more blasé. We've also become more skillful at finding our way into projects where that's not going to be such an issue. Um, and part of it is getting older and not being able to stay up for six days at a time doing a little temporary thing. We, we still want to be architects. <laughs>